Democratization of art is a big topic being discussed recently because of the rapid growth of generative AI. And it's normally discussed from a very technical standpoint that art is accessible and you can do anything anyone can learn just pencil and paper and you can put your ideas uh, and create uh, images from that and that is true to some extent as we can see here in this beautiful image by Ian McKegg uh, he is one of the artists out there in the industry mostly using uh, pencil and paper for his creations so that's definitely doable but today I want to try and paint a picture of the positive side and positive impact that large language models such as ChatGPT as well as generative AI um, algorithms, mid-journey, stable diffusion and so on can really help bring organization as well as beautiful images to a lot of different groups of people that normally aren't impacted by them. They might have uh, being impacted by big uh, entertainment productions such as the Jungle Book as we've seen here they normally won't get impacted by the beautiful pre-production artwork that a lot of amazing artists did but they will get the final product uh, but in a lot of different other contexts they won't be impacted by great art and that's what I want to discuss here I'm gonna break down the video into four parts the first of those being access to art as a whole and how the internet helps us and how can it be better uh, to be honest the second part is education but both from art an art standpoint as well as uh, historical depiction the third part is production uh, of those arts uh, and especially historical uh, in this sense I'm going to talk a little bit about where they are used nowadays and how can, can we find a feasible way that for them to be used in a different context and finally see some examples of generative AI uh, being used in this uh, specific area of historical illustration and how can we learn uh, as well in, as become better artists by using them as tools once again this specific context I will consider them as tools so jumping right in, the first part, as I mentioned, is access to art. If we look at a museum uh, nowadays, and I'm going to use this example by Jacques-Louis Davy, not all the people that go to the Louvre will get impacted by this image. Definitely everyone that goes there will see the Mona Lisa uh, and some uh, of the other uh, very famous pieces of art. But if it if this piece wasn't as big as this probably a lot of people would go right past that picture um, that happens when you go into the Mona Lisa uh, room not everyone will look back as we see some of the people here in the left side of the image looking back to the great uh, wedding at Cana by Veronese. I don't know if that's how you pronounce the name of the picture, uh, but there are lots of amazing details and depiction of great artists from, from the era. Uh, so a lot to be seen here and not everyone will be impacted by that. If you bring that to the context of the internet, uh, the Metropolitan uh, has like almost 500,000 images uh, in public domain displayed on their website that means that probably no one will see any of those because we don't have smart ways of organizing all this information some of that might be curated by some people uh, bringing context we've seen a lot of exhibitions museum exhibitions uh, catalogs you can buy the catalog books I have a lot of them. I love the work being done by curators out there. But what if we could have an individual curatorship? Things that you like, that you will, you will probably like most from those collections, 
organized with their stories brought from different sources uh, and curated and preparated in a way that you can access them the most. If we look back to the wedding at Cana, for me, what I love the most is that the depiction of famous painters from their era. Uh, and different instruments uh, have different meanings and a lot of that. It's way more than the biblical depiction here. But for some people, it might be what's happening in terms of the religious story. So what would be most interesting? For some people, it will be the Mona Lisa and the selfie. And I don't mind that. I, I, I mind that the other side is misrepresented. Nowadays, it's mostly the, the experience at the Louvre revolves around the Mona Lisa and other famous uh, statues and, and, and a very few, a handful of pieces. Uh, and that's it. You can have your uh, audio guide. A lot of people go through that, but that's not individually created. That doesn't have a lot of information from other museums uh, to bring to the context. And imagine that with AI. That that would be huge. At least that's something that really excites me. Images like this, Frederick Ar Arthur Bridgman. I would love to know more about the production process, what's being depicted here, this religious ritual in old uh, Egypt. Uh, even you can see uh, the headpiece here tells a lot if it's upper Egypt, lower Egypt, uh, if it's both together, depending uh, if they have some kind of elements. You can see the temple back there. What temple is that? And definitely AI will get to a point where it can do all that. It can this this kind of information can be uh, human made, but it needs to cater to a large enough audience so that it's feasible uh, production wise. So that's super hard to bring to the individual context. It's the same with general education. You tend to go with a normalized standard education, standard uh, standardized tests and so on. And, and that's, that will have a big difference with AI as well. This picture of Joan of Arc uh, by Lou, Jules uh, Bastien. I have never seen this picture uh, until recently I was reading a book and it came as an example so I jumped right into it and went to see more uh, details uh, the an angels or ex uh, spiritual beings giving messages to her as well as this image uh, from uh, Amathadema a lot of people might not know this. They will probably know the influence it had on Exodus by Ridley Scott as well as Gladiator. Uh, he used a lot of examples from Amathadema in his work. Uh, and a lot of people will not know that this painter had a huge collection of props that he brought from the Middle East, from Greece, and used in his paintings. He used a lot of the collection from the British Museum as well to populate his pieces. So that's a great information for artists when they're creating their images or for visitors to a museum where they are depicting some of the images that he used as reference. Wouldn't that be a great experience to see both of them next to each other? What if we could organize and create new images for every museum uh, exhibit so that each person can interact with that differently. And I really think that this is possible in the near future where we have a different experience in museums, especially enhanced by AR uh, and VR experiences. That will be uh, really big and will help drive our relationship with our past and how we see the world maybe i also would love to see something 
like this uh, done. This is a collection of work. I went through 200 pages of the collections from Google's Arts and Culture project, as well as the collection from the Louvre. Uh, so around 10,000 images to get the best looking images that would really inspire me from this era, uh, 2500 BC to 1500 BC. So a lot of things I learned here. Uh, I love this heap hole uh, from Egypt. I've seen this in Vienna in the Art History Museum. But definitely before that, I had never seen hippo sculptures from that era. Uh, and that was amazing to, to get to know. Or even like this duck paintings or lions from uh, Sumerian era. This Arcadian head mask. A lot of things that I have never seen before and that I would definitely love to see more. It's very labor intensive to do this. It's, lever it's even more labor intensive to find the creatorship that will impact me and that I will enjoy. So that will be another area where, where image uh, categorization as well as uh, labeling and, and so on will go a long way with this kind of images. We have uh, Mid Journeys described that is very, very early on, but we do have ChatGPT already reading images very, very well. So that will definitely go uh, really fast if they have access to this kind of collections. And as they are public domain, they will probably have uh, a lot of access to this. So going into education now, uh, I want to discuss First of all, art education, and I think there are lots of impacts in there. So I've done two videos here on the channel that are selecting and curating a lot of content out there. But this is already proof that art is not that accessible. To create a beautiful image, you really need to understand a lot of the concepts that are here, and for that, you first of all need to understand English that's already a barrier as well as have the money to buy some of those books and most of them are around 20 US dollars so the 15 here would be a thousand dollars at least some of the books in here can go up to hundred and fifty dollars so that's not accessible to a lot of people especially those not in the US, Europe, and so on. So that's the first point I want to make. Uh, and I did the same with tutorials. Those are more acce uh, accessible because they are online. Uh, they are more affordable, but they are also 10 US dollars in this case. So that would be for the 52, 520 uh, dollars. So not that expensive, but definitely not cheap. So having the right books, the right information, some of the information out there is free in the internet, but you don't have that accessible. YouTube channels such as mine tend to help a lot organize that information. A lot of other uh, channels tend to focus on giving the information themselves and not bringing different artists and different content for you to to really um, get exposed to. I focus on this other side because I don't know a lot of things, so I want to bring the right minds and pro uh, mostly curate than than bring the the final information. But definitely, if we had a way of bringing the right content to the right moment. So if you ask a chat GPT, oh, these are my drawings. This is the problems I'm facing. What do you recommend for me to do next? And I don't think we are very far away from that. Does that mean that our teachers are gonna get impacted? Definitely. Uh, that means that they're gonna become 
obsolete? Definitely not. Uh, there is a big, big difference in both of those. I'm not going to dive deeper into that. But human contact is a big part of art learning uh, in a broader sense of what we want to say, how we experience life, and so on. Really looking at other people and how they did that really goes a long way. It could be through art history and, and looking at amazing art and understanding the history behind those. Uh, but that could be just having conversation with someone that has have been through the same process you're going through. And the other big part is not on art education, but using art in general education. And that's where we'll jump into production and historical painting production uh, in part three. And the best way to really understand what goes behind historical painting is to look at James Gurney's book, Imaginative Realism. If you can look at those topics, all the topics that we see here, uh, understanding of history and archaeology, so what story do you want to tell, what's the information uh, needed, what's the best angle to convey that. If you're going to have people, all the drawings and tone paper studies, acting, gesture, using models, choosing models, uh, maquettes and 3D uh, art, 3D reference, architecture, both in 3D and maquettes as well, uh, understanding of the building blocks of architecture. I mentioned on my video uh, on Gabriel Yaganian's work. I'm going to talk about him a little bit later on, but understanding deeply of what's what makes a building and how it was built back then and what for what purpose vehicles and 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 so on as well as the understanding of light how to use that how to use real information going to museums as i mentioned uh, to really bring believability to what you're conveying and how that will impact uh, the people that are looking we get to composition and uh, heat maps of how people uh, eye tracking and how people look at images. That's to say that a lot goes into the production of every image that you see. So it could be a painting from back in the uh, 19th century or uh, something that was done like this, these artworks done for National Geographic. Uh, by James Gurney, Greg Menches, and John Berkey. There is a lot of research. Uh, Gurney goes through the process of this boat here in his book and the amount of research he did. So that's very expensive. That's a labor of love to some extent because a lot of the costs for gathering the, that information and going to historical museums and all of that will sometimes not be included in the overall budget uh, it should but sometimes it's not it's not feasible for that line of product and we're talking here about magazines that had subscription models uh, and so on imagine that in an education content even YouTube channels if they go too granular and too niche, then they can't pay this big fees. If we look at entertainment numbers, uh, we're talking about daily rates for uh, mid levels of like 350 US dollars to 500 US dollars for more senior people. Uh, you're talking about uh, full time jobs that pay 100K or more a year. It's very hard for educational purposes to really maintain this kind of high-level production. And, and this goes a long way 
into how we consume uh, education. I never liked history, and I'm using my example here. I would love to hear yours. I never liked history very much because I couldn't visualize a lot of the stuff and I didn't connect with that. It was just like dates and names and, and places and all of that. If I had been exposed to a lot of more of this artwork, potentially in an environment such as uh, what was done for Assassin's Creed, that I really would pay attention and, and, and want to learn more. Uh, if we look at this artwork here, it's incredible that they hired uh, Jean-Claude Gauvin to make these images. There is a great talk by uh, Raphael Lacoste that was the art director on the project. I'll add all links in the description. But having a historian and a historical illustrator in the project that understands the cities, the ancient cities and what they looked like, and it's pretty accurate with their depiction, helped a lot to understand what the final game was going to look like. They bring in the final visuals once they understand what's that going to look like, but the believability in the final game comes from this kind of bird's eye content and, and planning. I love Martin Deschambault's work as well and Jeff Simpson, all artists you should definitely follow. But how can we bring that outside of a multi-million dollar product such as Assassin's Creed? Uh, I love how they did the discovery uh, tours and you can buy that as a separate project. So check that out. Uh, it's really great for both uh, origins. I think all the recent titles uh, have that. Uh, but definitely that's not something that you normally see. That was a stretch. I don't know if that's being used in educational uh, contexts. I would love to see that. But in the end of the day, it's Assassin's Creed. It's not education material. It can have a little bit of a conflict of interest because it's assassinations and, and, and all of that. So how can we bring that beauty and beautiful images to, to educational content uh, without the big IP behind it? I would say it's impossible because you can't pay a Raphael Lacoste or a Deschambeau or a Jeff Simpson to work on educational content. Only if they want to do that for their own. Uh, I heard Craig Mullins is exploring uh, Wagner's ring, but that's because he wants to do that. It's not what he's being paid to do. His daily rate is way, way higher than the numbers that I mentioned. So it would be completely impossible to hire him for some kind of ed educational purposes. So how can we bring a little bit of that? And that's what I want to discuss in the AI part. And just as a final example, I've been uh, studying recently with Gabriel Yaganian. And the amount of thought that goes into his studies and what happened there uh, in the Mayan example in the right, how the these platforms were created and their purpose and how they, the overall village has life. It's a, it's a lot based on museum depictions and three-quarter views and bird-eye views of villages and so on. But brought to a next level of quality because he is trained very well in arts and uses a lot of this knowledge for sci-fi projects such as Star Wars and so on. But the final uh, illustrations and, and drawings that he uses to get there are mostly done for his educational purposes or for his own appreciation of that place or that specific architecture and not to teach, not to become an experience in a museum. 
So how could that be in that environment? Uh, and I do think that AI will play a big part in that, in helping get to that. It could be through generative AI and now using a lot of public domain work. All the artists that you're here, seeing here are already public domain or getting close to that. I think Maxfield Parrish and uh, Norman Rockwell are not they're not that their full artwork is not copyrighted uh, copyright free but those two artworks that i put in there are at least a hundred years old so they should be copyright free or are getting close to that uh, so a lot of different styles so beatrix potter arthur reckman even alphonse mucha uh, with more uh, cartoony illustration for that uh, magazine crocodile we can see it uh, up here Heinrich clay as well as more realistic de depictions lawrence amathadema as i said before uh, waterhouse zorn um birth moriso i don't know how to pronounce that uh, so a lot of different styles and uh, but all in a very high quality. So how can we use that? Howard Pyle is a big one uh, in here. I don't know if all his artwork is already copyright free, but I think so. Um, how can we use that to create a, an ethical uh, generative AI product that we can create, generate images that are going to be interesting and are, are going to be used in this context? Maybe firefly will be a little bit of a middle way where we can have artists creating images faster so that it's feasible to use in educational purposes i don't know what are your uh, opinions on that i would love to to hear those and maybe help find a solution for this uh, i've done some explorations just for an example here using midjourney I believe Midjourney hasn't disclosed the databases that they are using, but probably not copyright free, at least from what I understand. But they are giving an example of what could come next. If we jump right in here uh, and get a closer view of some of those images, I used only names of some of the artists that we saw in the public domain images. So Howard Pio here, uh, Joaquin Sorolla, uh, Edwin Lord Weeks in this one, and using some of the names of places uh, such as the Mayan uh, ruins, maybe uh, Chichen Itza, and, and all of that. Uh, here, a little more Sorolla. So, a lot of those lights come in if we use the name. Um, here, it's more of a, a little bit of a solstice. Uh, festival in Machu Picchu so a lot of different interesting depictions of Egyptians in different uh, places here once again Machu Picchu it, it's not Machu Picchu it's not the clothes that they should be using so that's where the artistic view and the archaeology knowledge would go a long way helping inform uh, what's there uh, but there are great images to be created using this kind of generative approach and we can see some details here more of the Aztecs and Mayans uh, as well as Indian ruins in architecture so really interesting to see how it's bringing a lot of information using the names uh, that I mentioned before Edwin Lord Weeks, Amathadema and so on uh, Howard Pyle, uh, I think I used on this to, to give a little bit of the palette and, and the figures. So combining some of the elements from art history to really get to a high quality final image. There are lots of different approaches to AI. So using Stable Diffusion with uh, ControlNet. I know that Stable Diffusion also uses databases that have uh, copyrighted materials. But if we get to that point where we can control 
and really give guidance to to that i think it will create great experience for for artists uh, last but not least i just want to mention that it's it's great for learning purposes as well for me being an artist i tried throwing in uh, a painting of mine an old painting i think i did this five years ago or so so i wanted to see what mid journey could teach me to do better so a lot of different exploration especially in v5 from mid journey so a lot of learnings here the way to use light contrasts reflections even storytelling adding a kid uh, will really emphasize some of the points that i didn't have in my first image it was uh, the water was too uh, dirty with a lot of in, uh, information uh, a cleaner reflection would go a long way here as well as simplifying a lot of the vegetation in some places uh, would also go a long way in guiding the eye to the right uh, place so that's something that i learned uh, even looking back here we can see that some of them uh, bring uh, more foregr foreground elements some some of them bring even more statues to the foreground uh, and that can help really emphasize uh, or or plants can really emphasize the depth so that would be another point that I would bring to my image if I was to repaint that. So a lot of learnings that would definitely I would learn if I had someone helping me and teaching me, uh, but something that I can learn from a generative AI or generative view like Adobe's Firefly. Uh, so a lot to be learned here. And even uh, going into the V3, uh, mid journey v3 and i have discussed this on other video that i think it's fresher uh, if we go back to the earlier versions there is a lot to learn in terms of composition it doesn't follow what i gave it mostly tries to look at some colors and some elements of columns and, and all of that but it gives a fresher uh, way of looking at that topic so this is definitely a great one and it reminded me of the hanging gardens uh, from Babylon so that would be also a great topic to explore and I did that in v3 and the results are really inspiring uh, all that could be done really to get to uh, interesting depictions of what that could look like we do have some illustrations uh, from what this place could have been but it would be great to have even some artistic license uh, and really explore uh, that. And going to V5, as I said before, it gets closer to what's being fed to the algorithm, but some interesting results using Joaquin Sorolla. So we get his lights, a little bit of his lights um, in the final image. So that's pretty much it. I hope it was inspiring to some extent of what the future could look like if we do use this in an ethical way and trying to get more information to people that normally don't get that. I totally understand the privilege of being able to live around art for such a long time and discuss art a lot and and look at beautiful images so I, I really think of how can i do that to emphasize the way we learn and maybe the way we see the world and different people see the world and even learn from the way that they are seeing the world so that's it i uh, hope you enjoyed the video if you did, you probably will enjoy other videos here on the channel that discuss art in its most different ways. And I definitely hope to see you again soon and have a great one.